Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new to Antioch, um, we're really glad you're here. And if you're part of this wonderful, blessed family, it's really great to see you from this side. Um, always great to see all your faces. It's a unique sight from here and a welcome one. Um, I wanted to give a shout out. Um, we're in the, just at a month of Andrew's sabbatical. And I wanted to say, I'm, I'm one of the elders here, and I wanted to just thank all of you. You all amaze me. It seems like every, no, it is. Every time I look around and there's a need, somebody steps into it. This is not a church that waits around for someone else or some leader to step into it. You're all leaders, and I just want to thank you on an incredible job as I look around and watch all of you step up. So I want to thank you for that. And our staff, man, they're doing an amazing job. I office right next to them, so I can tell you the truth. They're an amazing staff, and I want to thank them for that. And uh, another shout out I want to give is, you know, on Thursday night, I think it was that I texted Emily and said, hey, could we do throne room? And we have a team that gets to, they respond, and it sounds like that. I mean, we went and saw her, Charity, in concert. I'm telling you, she's got nothing over this team, so <laughs> way to go. This is just fantastic. And by the way, I think I might have given all my voice to worship, and so this could be a struggle. Um, just a hint, when I sit in the front row, I let it loose because I can't in the second or third row because I could hurt somebody. My voice is horrible. I often sometimes wonder if I might even distract the worship team with how bad it is up here. But when I'm in the front, I let it rip. We're a Bible-believing, note-taking church, so please take out something and be ready to take some notes and come with a high expectation that God will have something to say to every single one of us as we open his word. I have the privilege of preaching a four-week series for the month of June. I want to intro this series by reading from chapters from two chapters of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5. I know we usually stand for the reading of the Word of God, and we're going to, actually, when we get to the passage for this week. But this, this series, or these two chapters, are what I'm actually going to build the next four weeks on. And so I just want to read them completely, and I want you to stay seated and soak these, this vision in, or follow as the scriptures on the screen. Revelation 4 starts like this. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one was sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 elder thrones, 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads." Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are all the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. The second creature was like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him and who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of you they will existed, they were created. Now the second act of this incredible scene. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. So I began to weep 
greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. Look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and the seven seals. And I saw between the throne with four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book... Four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people from every nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads and myriads of thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea. And all of them, I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. One of my favorite two chapters in the scriptures in the glorious and wondrous scene that we are given of Jesus and of Father God. Revelation is often associated with times of battle and end times destruction. And the term revelation can bring a bit of fear and intimidation. But the word actually means the unveiling. That's all revelation means. Literal translation is the unveiling. And the writer distinctly states at the beginning of the writing that the revelation is the unveiling of Jesus and all his power and his wonder and his glories. And sometimes we mistakenly believe and live out the fact kind of that someday, someday Jesus will rule. Someday Jesus will come into his throne. Someday Jesus will begin to make things right. And in the revelation, we are invited in the spirit to look upon Jesus and realize that Jesus is already ruling all things. Jesus is on his throne right now, and he is moving right now. And we get to see that. And the act of making things right and and the right and the return of the rule and the reign of God on earth has already started, and it will not be stopped. It cannot be stopped. Isaiah says it will be the zeal of the Lord who will make sure that it is completed. While there are many truths to be grabbed from these two chapters of four and five, I want to grab one big idea that will be my umbrella for the series and over the next four weeks. In the chapter four, a scene is described with rainbows and precious stones and colors and beauty and wonder beyond description. There are elders, all of themselves, very grand, but like everyone and everything else, they are focused solely on Jesus. There is lightning and thunder and the spirit of God is covering and empowering everything. And there are new and awesome creatures surrounding the throne. They too focused on one thing and one thing only. They're focused on Jesus. Honestly, the wonder of all of this that shows is kind of completely beyond our full understanding right now and will be displayed for us. We will fully see it and understand it when we too stand before Jesus, before his throne. And I await that day. The overwhelming fact is that everyone, everything, and every color and even every precious stone are overwhelmed by the presence of the Lamb, by the presence of Jesus. With the revelation of Jesus and all his glory, everyone and everything respond in a single, united response as they say in one accord over and over and over again, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Holy, holy, holy. We sing that refrain in a lot of our worship songs. And it's beautiful and it's right. And, 
And we need to understand that that term, holy, 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 is not an emphatic emotional response to something. Holy, holy, holy is a title, and it is reserved for one, only for Jesus. When we say holy, 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 we are making a proclamation of a title of who Jesus is, a distinction uniquely held by Jesus, and a proclamation true only of Jesus. When we sing holy, holy, it can only be for one, and that is for Jesus. Yes, God through Jesus miraculously imparts his holiness to us, but it's still his holiness that he imparts to us. We know holiness, experience holiness, and even our imparted holiness only because of Jesus. The scene then continues in chapter 5, where all get this compelling picture of a pivotal moment in history, a time when all living beings, past, present, and future, and a time when all of life, salvation, healing, truth, justice, and hope will be revealed and released over the earth and all of the heavens. And this must happen. But for this release to happen, the seals of the scrolls must be broken. And we see this heartbreaking scene where an angel cries out and says, who will break the scrolls? Who will break the seals? So that all of this can be released. And one by one by one, every creature, every man, every woman, every being, every angel tries and cannot break the seals. And that's why John weeps out loud. Because he sees that no one can break the seals and unleash what we're all waiting for and what we all need. And a cry goes out to the open seals and everyone tries and no one can. But an elder steps out and says, stop weeping because there is one. And out from behind the throne steps that one. It is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, the lamb who is slain, it's Jesus. And all of creation begin to cry out because they know he alone is worthy to open the seals and release what must be released. And they all fall down in worship. The only response. Worthy is the lamb that is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I don't know about you, but these two chapters stir up me awe and wonder and joy and promise and hope and the assurance that all things are being made new. And I don't know about you, but I need that assurance. And I love that assurance and need that assurance. The thing, the fact that jumps out from these two scenes and then what I want to build the series on is this one unmistakable takeaway. And that is the distinct uniqueness of Jesus above every created thing. No matter if man or angel or beast, it doesn't matter, there is a unique distinctness of Jesus. Jesus is unique in who he is, holy in his very essence, and he is wholly other than anything else can ever be. It is not like we acclaim to be. He is in a different category, and he is wholly other. And we need him to be wholly other than we can ever be. And also, Jesus is utterly unique in what he can do. There are things Jesus can give to us and do for us that no other person, thing, or created thing can give us or do for us. This is why the title for our series for the next week is this, this, Only Jesus. And the subtitle for this week is Only Jesus, Clarity in Our Questions. I would venture to say that not one of the things that we cover in this series are going to be new to us. But I am believing that by focusing on them and taking a deep dive into them, that the result will be that we have an even deeper awareness of the uniqueness of our Jesus an even deeper understanding of the power we have available to us through Jesus, a deeper understanding of Jesus' love for us and a deeper love for us for Jesus. 
That's my prayer. Because just like Jesus said, that is where life is. In those things, knowing those things, believing those things, taking those things deep, that's where life is. So with that, the world's longest introduction, will you stand with me, please, for the reading of the passage that we'll preach on this week? It's John 1, verses 1, and only one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Lord, as we dive into this very deep and rich passage, may we just very simply have a fuller and more complete revelation of all that John was communicating and all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word the word was with God and the word was God. A verse many of us have heard hundreds of times. Quite honestly, a verse that I sometimes read pretty quickly because I've read it so many times. But why? Why does John choose to describe Jesus as the word? Out of all of the titles and all the things, why did he choose this? Does it really matter? How does describing Jesus, the word, fit into all that we discussed in the terms of uniqueness of Jesus in both essence and strength? There are four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of the Gospels are called Mar Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. Only John, the fourth Gospel, uses the title of word for Jesus. None of the other three Gospels use it. With all the scriptural titles that at his disposal, King, Lord, Sa Savior, Messiah, to introduce Jesus through his gospel, why did John choose to start with Jesus is the word? To answer that question, we need to take a journey into John's life leading up to him penning these words or dictating these words. And John's gospel is very different from the other gospels. The other three gospels are pretty much alike, telling the same story just from a different vantage point and for a different audience. That's why those three gospels are called the synoptics, which means the same or all together. And they tell very much the same story, but they're differently dictated because they're aimed at different audiences. John takes a completely different approach in writing his gospel. While the other gospels make Jesus' deity clear, John makes Jesus' godness his pretty much his sole focus. If you look at John, what John is trying to communicate is the deity of Jesus, and that is pretty much his sole focus. We get more of the heart of Jesus than we, in John's gospel than we do for the other gospels. Why did John take a different approach to revealing Jesus than the other three Gospels? Well, here is what we know about John and when he wrote this. John's Gospel was written after the other three synoptic Gospels. Those Gospels had begun to be circulated, and it's very likely that John had either read them or, heard, or at least heard them. And it seems likely that John read these Gospels and felt like it was fa it's fair for us to assume that he needed to add something to those three synoptic records. He read or heard them, and he thought, I've got to add something to these. There's nothing that indicates, there's nothing in John's Gospel that corrects the other Gospels. It's not a Gospel of correction, but it is a Gospel of addition. So that may seem like it's a little bit arrogant for John to think, well, I got to add some stuff. But why would he be able to do that? Because John was closer to Jesus than the other gospel writers. To Jesus, and in, other, in fact, John accompanied Jesus on major events that only a few others accompanied Jesus on. Most of the time, it was just John, Peter, and James who got to see some major events that no one else got to see. John was with Jesus at the Transfiguration, where God, Moses, and Elijah confirmed Jesus as God's son. John was with Jesus when he miraculously healed Peter's mother-in-law. Andrew got to be in on that one. And then when Jesus raised the little girl from the dead, John was there, and he saw it, something the other gospel writers had not seen. 
And so John is described as the disciple Jesus loved. It is clear that John had an especially close relationship with Jesus. But there's another experience unique to John, and that is the revelation. As I said earlier, the revelation is really just the unveiling of Jesus and all his majesty and power. The verses I read in the introduction, those visions were given to John, the writer of John's gospel. Now, there is some uncertainty in terms of the timing of the gospels in Revelation, but new evidence points very probably that John wrote his gospel after he had been given the revelation from God. And so he, in addition to experiencing things that none of the other gospel writers, he now had the vision that he'd been given of the revelation, and now he writes his gospel. What was John's reaction to the vision he was given about Jesus in Revelation? Revelation 1.17 says this, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. We need to remember, this is the man, the man writing this statement is a man who ate with Jesus, sat with Jesus, walked with Jesus, joked around with Jesus, laid his head on Jesus' breast. Never this kind of reaction. But once he sees the revelation of Jesus ruling and reigning on his throne, he has a little bit different reaction, like he falls dead. Because this is a new Jesus to him. This is no longer just Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi, the friend. This is God. When he sees Jesus now, he sees God. And the point is that Jesus had revealed to John in a way that he had not been revealed to any other human being. And so John, at the writing of his gospel, was very old. And I think it's fair for us to assume that as he writes his gospel, he's doing it with some passion and some urgency. When he realizes, here are the Gospels, they are all correct. There's nothing wrong with them. But there's some things that I alone can tell the world. Because Peter and James, who had also been at the Transfiguration in some of those events, have now already been martyred. There's no one to tell these stories except me. And so I think it's exciting to think of the urgency in which he writes. There are some things about Jesus that I have seen and that I know I have to write them down or they die with me. And that's the history in which we read this gospel. So that's where his, his passion and his urgency, and I think that's a fair picture for us to look and to say, and that's why um, John focused so much on, on Jesus' deity and wisdom and wonder and power, and with all this urgency and passion and purpose and conveying the truth of Jesus, John opens his gospel with what we read in the beginning was the word. And I look and I go, word? We just built up this whole big backstory. John knows things that nobody else knows. He's got passion and urgency to convey all those things. He's got an opening sentence in his gospel and he chooses Jesus is the word. And I'm kind of like, wow. <laughs> Word's a nice word. It's a good word. I guess it's unique. But why? With all that I've just laid out, why would he choose word? And this is where we must return ourselves to the people and times and the understanding of the times of John's gospel was written. To understand the power and expansive, explosive statement that this opening sentence makes. We must hear it in the language and in the context and in the audience that would have read it at the time that it was written, the people that John was writing to at the time. How he had to write it in a way that how would the Jews hear it? How would the Gentiles hear it? How would the Romans hear it? How would the leaders hear it? How would the philosophers hear it? John took all this, I believe, in the, in, into his consideration. Scientists, teachers, educated, mathematicians. He didn't care. What do I choose? What do I use to describe Jesus so that everyone who reads this, not just my Jewish family, but everyone who reads this understands the statement that I'm making. And when you look at John's choice of words that way, we see that John's choice of word was bold, loud, definitive, and undeniable to the culture and the people of the time. 
No matter the religion, the culture, their education, or their political position, the word John chose to use was nothing less than dynamite. And everybody would have known it who read it. You see, the Greek word John chooses that we translate word was logos. And logos was a huge term that had powerful meaning to all the people, all the cultures, all the backgrounds of the time. A leading philosopher used logos at the time to express how he explained, he used logos to explain the power behind the universe. Other famous philosophers at the time used logos to express all thought behind reason. And then Stoics, who rejected any physical nature and the reality of pain, used logos to describe what was the soul of the world. Religious leaders used the term to describe the different manifestations of God. Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome, used it to describe the power behind nature. Are you beginning to see what John did? He basically said, he took all of this and he said, all of these things that you can't explain, they're all assigned to this power. And what do you call it? Word. Logos in their language. Do you see what John is starting to lead up to? Every religious leader, every political power broker, every great thinker identified the things that were beyond their understanding and their explanation. Everything that was too big, too confusing, too grand for the greatest minds on earth to come up with an explanation or an understanding of it, they assigned to the Logos. And John's opening line of the gospel, John is saying to all of them, there is one who controls and explains everything that you don't know and that you can't explain and that you do not understand. There is one. And John takes it a step further, that the Logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John is writing his gospel and choosing the word he chooses to describe Jesus as making the greatest possible dynamic claim he could have made at the time to anybody that would have read his gospel. The power behind the universe that you've all been struggling to define and debating about the power of nature that you have no explanation for. You want to be able to define and understand reason? You want to talk about what the human soul is and what drives it? You want to know what the manifestation of God looks like? You call it Logos? Well, I have seen him. I have walked with him. I heard him teach, and I saw him rise from the dead and seated in power. John is taking the, this way beyond just his Jewish religious background. He's taking his message to the world. And John loudly proclaims about Jesus what the rest of Scripture confirms. In Acts, he's the one who freed us from all religion that could not be. He's the, in Colossians, he's before all things, and him him all things together. In Hebrews, he's the son of radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the word of his power. And in Corinthians, he's the yes to every promise. In John's word, logos, John has chosen to say, all the things that you do not understand, all the things that you yearn to understand, all of the things that you great educated people cannot explain, I know it, and you associate with Logos, and Logos has a name, and his name is Jesus. It was a beautiful statement to the world, and everybody would have known its claim. To call Jesus the word was audacious, and John knew it. John, with some of his last words to the world, was proclaiming who has answers to the human heart, the human condition, the human journey. Jesus, only Jesus, audacious. What is the application for us today? Isn't it exactly the same application 
as it was the time it was written? Think about it. Think about it. We pursue answers. We pursue understanding. We pursue wisdom. We pursue strength. And we pursue control. Have we found it? 2,000 years later, philosophically, have we arrived at the answers? There are more questions about the meaning and purpose of life than ever. Politically, have we arrived? Or is there more division right now and stronger hatred among the political arguments than at any time any of us can remember? What about religion? Hasn't religion itself turned out to be exactly what Jesus said it would be? Weak, full of rules and judgment, and void of power. Medically, hasn't this past three years revealed that even 2,000 years later, we are completely vulnerable to things that science cannot stop and cannot change? I contend that the application to the world today is exactly the same as it was 2,000 years ago. And it will be that way until the Lord returns. I think this is the beauty of John's cry to the world. John does not offer any reasons, does not offer any explanations to any of these questions. He does not offer any understanding, and he doesn't pretend that any of us are going to get control. Instead, he knows that the answer is just in this, not in answers. The answer's in a person. And that's what John points us to. Not wisdom, not knowledge, not learning, not education, a person. And there he is. And he has all your answers and he has all your clarity. Paul said it this way, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Let me ask you a question. If everything that is written about Jesus is true, what do I have to worry about today? What do you have to worry about today? It's a compelling question. Proclaiming Jesus as the Logos was saying, by John saying to that question, it's true. It's all true. Everything you're reading, everything you're believing, everything you want to believe, it's all true. That was John's proclamation in that opening statement. And it's powerful. Our peace is not in wisdom and knowledge. It's not in knowing. It's not in planning. And it never will be. That goal has never worked and it never will. Not because God does not want us to have understanding. He knows that peace will never be found there. And that's why Jesus stands and cries out, come to me. Come to me. Peace is in a person, not in one person, but in one unique person, the one who alone is holy, the one who alone has the power to deliver peace to our hearts and souls. Peace is found only in Jesus. That's why we say only Jesus. What is the application for what what do we do? We do what Hebrews directs us to do. It sounds simple, but it's not. Doesn't make it untrue, though. It's still the answer. What we do is we fix our eyes on Jesus. No matter what happens, no matter what shakes us, no matter what comes in our lives, our struggle and our battle is to fix our eyes on Jesus. What does this actually look like? I'm going to take a risky, I'm going to make a risky illustration here. It may fall really flat, but I'm going to go for it. I have an illustration in my life that has given me a picture and has impacted me for 20 years. Every time I get in trouble, I get this picture in my mind and I know what to go for. I watched a movie and I know, I think movies imitate life, so I'm okay with that. I watched a movie and a man comes back from the Civil War 10 years after being in war. He's able to take on a different identity. It's believable how it happens. The facts don't matter. He able to take on a different identity and leave what he was before behind. And so he does that because what was behind was really, really ugly. And so as he proceeds in his life, he gains a wife. He has a new baby. 
and the town that had been ravaged by the war, he rebuilds by making sharecroppers out of all of the people. It was all his land. He gives it all away, makes sharecroppers, and he gives an entire town purpose and meaning and power to live. And it's dwelling and, and, and prospering, and it's beautiful. And then one day, some men come, and they arrest this man for murder. They accuse him of murder. And he goes on trial, and all he has to do, if he's guilty, he's going to hang. All he has to do to be released is to take up his former identity. But he won't. He won't. Even when his wife begs him to do it, he says, I won't. Because he realizes that by taking up his old identity, he then makes his wife in a culture, he makes his wife illegitimate in a culture that that would have been very problematic for. And he makes his child illegitimate. And all those contracts that he gave to all the sharecroppers that revived the town, they all become false. And the town is destroyed. And he says, I won't do it. And so it's an amazing picture because I'm watching this and this man is steadfast on what he must do and he has perfect peace and no fear as he steps towards his own execution. He says one thing to his wife as they're taking him away. I can do this if you're there. And she says, I can't. I can't watch you die. And they pull him away. And they lead him up for the ending event, and he's looking out, and for the first time in this whole scene, he gets anxious, and he gets afraid, and he starts fighting against his captors. And he's scanning the crowd and looking for his wife, and all of a sudden, out of the crowd, she screams as she runs to the front, I'm here. And I watch this scene, and this man just looks and locks on her eyes. And he stands up, takes a deep breath, and lets him do what he was called to do. And I remember seeing that scene and thinking, that's what it can be like for me and Jesus, only more so. In every struggle, in every hardship, in every trial, no matter what, don't look for the answer, look for his eyes. Do whatever you have to do. Read scripture, pray, worship, wait, listen. Salvation is in his eyes. And it's available. And he will be there. I don't care what you're going through or what you will go through. He will be there. And he will be enough. And only Jesus can make that claim that promise. Let's stand together. We always have a time to respond. And I wanted to open the response time by saying, I've tasted of that closeness to Jesus. And I've left it at times. And I'm kind of a little far from it right now. Not from my faith, just from that closeness, overwhelming assurance that Jesus is enough in everything. So the invitation today is just simply this. If you need a refreshing lock of your eyes on the promise and the hope of Jesus, no matter what it is for now or for the future, come forward and just get some prayer. You don't have to do a lot of explanation. Our team will be um, forward here. And as the worship team pray, uh, plays, please, just come forward and ask. Ask to see him with fresh eyes and fresh knowledge, fresh understanding and fresh faith.